The students, they worked pretty hard this semester, um, pouring a lot of oil, getting really dirty, um, working with poop as well, uh, um, as well as like just looking at our systems of plastic and like other solid waste. So um, they did really good work, so I'm gonna let them explain more, all right? So. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here. I'm Ethan. I'm Owen. I'm Renato. I'm Reagan. I'm Matthew. I'm Abigail. And today we will be presenting to you all on sustainable waste management. <clears throat> Municipal solid waste can be best described as discarded material resulting from human activity. Essentially, it's what you all are likely to call trash. However, unlike trash, solid waste can be used again. We, the biogas team, have been looking at ways for us to either reuse trash or find other methods to keep it out of the landfill. One of the ways that we can do this is by looking at the hierarchy of waste management. The first steps of these is source reduction. By reducing our waste intake at the source, you of course can reduce the amount of your waste ending up in landfills. There's also recycling and composting, as well as conversion technology such as waste to energy systems. Uh, that all help keep your waste out of landfills, which is the least preferred method of waste management. On campus, we do our best to encourage source reduction as much as we can, as well as we recycle through our waste sorting in Bay 1, where it's then shipped out to Nassau to be recycled. We have compost piles on campus where biodegradable material is set to compost naturally. And we have uh, conversion technologies such as biodiesel, which runs all of our vans, and biogas, which we've been studying in our class through the means of anaerobic digestion. The biogas team has been focused on the goal of finding a sustainable way to manage solid waste. We've done so by exploring different sustainable waste management technologies and evaluating the current status of waste on campus. The biogas team has looked into anaerobic digestion as a way to help mitigate surpluses of waste. Anaerobic digestion is a series of natural biological processes that use a diverse population of bacteria to break down organic matter. Organic matter is recently living matter such as human waste or food waste. That biomass is then converted into biogas, primarily methane. Methane can be used interchangeably with propane. Another fluent in the process is the digestate, which can be used for fertilizer and water, which can be used for irrigation, which is very important since water is such a finite resource. There are many benefits to anaerobic digestion, so the class even made a replica anaerobic digester to spread awareness to these benefits. One benefit of anaerobic digestion is freeing up space in landfills because biodigestion diverts the track biomass takes from, landing up and from ending up in a landfill. Next, biodigestion is a waste to energy system, so it turns something useless, such as your human waste, into something useful, such as energy. Next, biodigestion is cost effective because the importation of fossil fuels to small island developing states such as the Bahamas is very expensive. That being said, that importation takes a toll on the environment through carbon emissions, so producing gas on site through anaerobic digestion is better for the environment. In our research class, we focused on a couple problems. The first being the amount of waste vegetable oil taking up space in the boneyard, as well as the green jugs which uh, contain the oil. We wanted to eliminate these from the boneyard as they were just sitting there and taking up space. However, we didn't know how, as because they were sitting there, we could no longer use them to make um, biodiesel. Another issue that we looked at was the issue of uh, education on campus of waste management and the behaviors that come with that. Our objectives in order to solve some of these problems were first to consolidate some of this waste vegetable oil and consolidate the jugs, as well as possibly educating campus further on waste management and their behaviors. And furthermore, to re-implement the anaerobic digester as a means to uh, digest the waste vegetable oil into biogas. In order to tackle these objectives, the biogas team focused on three major tasks. Our first task was to re-implement the anaerobic digester into the CIS community. This is a visual of um, okay. this is a visual of the boneyard, the boathouse, CSD, and our digester. In the boneyard, you, all of the light green is all of the green jugs containing the waste vegetable oil, 
Being that the boneyard and the boathouse are in such close proximity, it becomes a potential hazard to have our campuses dumped so close to a body of water. In the first two weeks of class, we poured 1,000 gallons of waste vegetable oil into the anaerobic digester. This oil was poured in two segments of 500 gallons each. This is a visual of the digester we have on campus. Our influent comes in through the valve. It then goes into the primary digester, also known as the floating dome. We then have our effluent where we can continue to do further testing. It then moves on to a secondary digester, also known as the fixed dome. And then we have our digestate, which can be used for fertilizing on campus. All of the methane and carbon dioxide produced from our digester is then stored in the floating dome. Our effluent is tested for pH, temperature, volatile acids over alkalinity, and conductivity. These are three different oil samples taken from our digester. The first oil sample is prior to um, digestion. Our second um, oil sample is post-primary digestion, and our third oil sample is post-primary and secondary digestion. If you, if you look at all three oil samples, you can see um, a drastic change in the oil breakdown, and the quality begins to get clearer over time. pH is a very important test to do during anaerobic digestion. pH tells us how acidic or basic our solution is. Most anaerobic bacteria prefer slightly neutral pH, which would be between the ranges of 6.5 and 7.5. Um, by the first day of our testing, we already had pretty high numbers of acidification, but as it went down of our hydraulic retention time, we gained more of a slightly acidic pH. Alkalinity is how well a biodigester can resist change in pH. A beneficial set of numbers to follow would be the volatile acids and alkalinity ratio, which is 0.1 to 0.15. Sadly, by a first day of our hydraulic retention time, it was above the 0.15 number, which means that our biodigester runs the risk of inefficiency. This chart just shows how well alkalinity and pH works hand in hand. Basically, as pH goes down, alkalinity goes up. This just means that they are very dependent on each other. When testing our temperature change over time, we found that our temperature stayed consistently in the mesophilic range. Being in the mesophilic range meant that our temperature stayed anywhere between 20 degrees to 40 degrees Celsius. Our conductivity was a measure of nutrients and salt in our digester. Our conductivity starts off relatively high and decreases over time. This is because of the bacteria in digester consuming all of the um, nutrients and salts. On October 19th, we see a change in conductivity, which just meant that there was a loss of bacteria and there were drastic changes in pH. When we perform tests on the biodigester, as mentioned before, we test both the influent and the effluent. In the influent, we test the free fatty acid concentration. Free fatty acids are liberated fatty acid chains from a triglyceride molecule due to oxidation, light, heat, or just general degradation over time. Because the oil that we poured in the boneyard has a high free fatty acid concentration, it is too poor qu quality oil to make biodiesel. However, it can be used to make biogas. In the effluent, we test pH, and as mentioned before, anaerobic digestion requires a relatively neutral pH to function and to foster healthy bacteria. The pH that we measured was slightly lower than ideal operation ranges. However, calcium carbonate, which is an alkaline substance, can be added to the digester, and hopefully that pH will be brought back up. In the effluent, we also test, as mentioned before, volatile acids over alkalinity. And volatile acids over alkalinity is one of the most important control features of digestion operations, and a change in this ratio is indicative of potential biodigester operation problems. Because our volatile acid over alkalinity ratio was constantly changing, we knew that we did not have as healthy as, of an operation system as, as we hoped. However, because pH and, and volatile acids over alkalinity are so closely related, the addition of this calcium carbonate will address this problem and bring the ratio back to ideal ranges. Um, our next task was to send out a waste survey to the community to get a better understanding of what we need to educate on on campus. This is a video of our survey. Our survey was split up into two sections, being solid waste management and biogas. After sending out the survey, we found out that 100% of the campus felt that they need to be better educated on solid waste management. 
Another question we asked on our waste knowledge survey is how concerned are you about solid waste management on Eleuthera and at the Island School? The results for the two questions were shockingly different. More people seem concerned about waste management on Eleuthera than at the Island School. We believe this is due to the fact that Eleuthera does not have many things in place for proper waste management and lack the infrastructure and education. Our last task was to conduct the waste audit where we segregated all of the waste in Bay 1 in order to find out what percentage of it was improperly sorted. Bay 1 has eight different sections of um, separating your waste. We have plastics 1, 2, and 5, plastics 3, 4, 6, and 7, aluminum, scrap metals, paper, glass, landfill, and biohazard. Of these eight, sec of, of these eight sections, plastics one, two. Plastics one, two, and five, aluminum and glass are recyclable. Plastics three, four, six, and seven get incinerated. Scrap metals, landfill, and biohazard are unfortunately sent to the boneyard. Plastics one, two, and five are mostly recyclable products that mean that contain products such as food and beverage cans, caps, and personal hygiene products. Of our waste audit, we found that 44% make up food and beverage, and in our improperly sorted section, 68% make up food and wrappers. This tells us that we have a lack of education in how to sort plastics in Bay 1. We then audited plastics 3, 4, 6, and 7, and of those, we found that 39% were improperly sorted. Being that that 39% um, consisted of a lot of plastics, 1, 2, and 5, we found that there was a common misconception on the difference between plastics 1, 2, and 5 and plastics 3, 4, 6, and 7. Finally, we audited the metals bin in Bay 1. Of all of the aluminums in the metal bin, we found that 60% were cans and 40% were improperly sorted. Improperly sorted metals go straight to the landfill, and this tells us that a lack of education can lead to destruction. We conducted a waste audit because we wanted to know how much waste we produce as a campus and how much of that waste is improperly sorted. We found that 31% of our waste is improperly sorted. It's important to sort your waste because when a recycling plant gets a shipment and too much of that waste is improperly sorted, they will send the whole shipment to a landfill. As Manata mentioned earlier, we poured out 1,000 gallons of oil out of these green jugs. Instead of sending these empty jugs to a landfill up north or to NASA to get recycled, we decided as a CSD community to reuse these as waste bins around campus. After getting the results back from our survey, we found that people did not feel educated enough to recycle properly and sort their waste. So as a CSD community, we all decided to put labels on these bins to make it so they're already sorted before they get to Bay 1, hopefully reducing the amount of improperly sorted waste. In October, the biogas team went down island to look at the landfills and dump sites in Eleuthera. There is one main difference between landfills and dump sites, and that is a plastic liner. Ideally, landfills have plastic liners between the waste and the ground to protect the soil and groundwater from contaminants that may seep out of the waste, whereas dumps do not have this liner. Eleuthera has one landfill and an abundance of dumps, but this one landfill does not actually have a plastic liner, which means that it is incorrectly classified as a landfill and is actually a dump. This chart was filled out to look at the different sources of concern found in landfills and in dump sites in Eleuthera. These are all items commonly found in these landfills and as you can see they all um, are hazardous to humans, the environment, or both. These hazards can spread through many means and although it may not seem like it, by just looking at food waste and tires and plastic bags, they are all extremely, extremely harmful in the long term. From this chart, we can give a general assessment of where Eleuthera is on the solid waste management hierarchy and what technologies need to be implemented in order to more sustainably manage waste. For example, since a lot of food waste was found in the landfill, technologies such as anaerobic digestion or composting can be implemented to divert some of that food waste from ending up in the landfill and to um, create that methane in a controlled environment. Of course, these technologies, such as composting and anaerobic digestion, are less ideal than source reduction. In order for source reduction to be more efficiently implemented into the Bahamas, new policies have to be created. The Bahamas recently passed the, Environment, the Environmental Protection Act, 
which prohibits certain single-use plastics from being sold and balloons from being released. This act will take effect on January 1, 2020. While this is a step in the right direction towards source reduction in the Bahamas, it is clear through our waste audit and our survey that we need to take more steps towards source reduction as a CEIS community. Um, source reduction, implementation, and enforcement is extremely difficult, but ultimately it is the strongest solution to the global issue of solid waste management. We would like to extend our gratitude to the communications team, the facilities team, Chris and Pam Maxey, Mike Cortina, Charlotte Francis Cartwright, Cam Raguse, Seep, Richard Johnson, and Manny Rujo. Thank you for all of your help. This is our literature cited, and are there any questions? Is any of this data been shared with the local Lutheran government? Are they appreciative of it, or are they saying, stay out of my business? Well, as part of our legacy project, one of our more ambitious goals is to get in touch with local community officials who are in charge of the municipal solid waste on Eleuthera. So hopefully they'll be willing to like accept like what we found and hopefully in the future implement technologies such as anaerobic digestion. Yeah. Yeah. In, in the recycling process, when you have say something as a shampoo bottle or, or anything like that, how important is it to be put into the recycling bin clean versus dirty? So the question asked was how important is it is our recyclables to be clean when put in like a recycling bin. Um, when we were doing our waste audit, like a lot of things that we found that like were either food or products that weren't cleaned out, we kind of had to like take them out of the recycling pile and clean it out ourselves. So it's like it makes a, a huge difference when people clean out their either food containers or product containers when, before placing them in Bay One. Um, the question was whether or not the vegetable oil in the boneyard is the, the island school community or just ours. Is that it? Or, or, the, or a Luthra. Or a Luthra's. So the oil that we have in the boneyard all comes from like cruise ships that come around and they drop off their oil to us so we can create biodiesel or biogas from it. But since our biodiesel, or our biodiesel system has kind of been shut down for a few years, it's been building up in the boneyard, and that's where our problem has started. Why was the system shut down to begin with? The question is, why was the system shut down? Um, a lot of the oil that we were getting wasn't of the best quality, so a lot of the free fatty acid concentration was not good enough to produce biodiesel, and we were instead just producing a lot of soap instead of biodiesel. What changed? Well, instead of making biodiesel, we're making biogas. So that just means that even though the free fatty acid concentration is too high, we can still use that oil to produce methane and CO2. Yeah. Yeah. Is there any risk um, with the um, site where the methane gas is housed that there could be a possible explosion? I hate to say the word, but you know, I mean, that could be dangerous. Is there parameters in place to make sure that that does not occur? The question was, is the methane that we're storing at, in any like hazard to the community, whether like it can blow up or just become a hazard? So when we reevaluated the inner digester after not being able to use it for a few years, um, there was a and um, we analyze the regulations around the digester, and so as long as we are able to manage the digester regularly and make sure that all of the proper precautions are in place, um, the, the technologies ensure that the methane is um, adequately stored, and as long as we are um, taking out this biogas and utilizing it, and not too much is 
um, being trapped in the biodigester at one time, then it, will, it won't be a hazard. What happens with the automobile tires, the rubber tires? So the question was, what happens with the automobile tires at a dump? So typically dumps in Eleuthera are just open air dumps where they practice open air burning. So if a tire were to find its way into a dump site on Eleuthera, it would likely be burned with all the other waste around it.